You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 72. Are associates money makers or colleagues? This week, we discuss a little bit about what John and I have changed in our practice over the last year and some pretty interesting things about what we're looking forward to in the coming months. We're also excited to talk a little bit about your practice and are you really a good leader? Is there a myth out there that small businesses are very successful? We discuss whether you're an entrepreneur, whether you're a manager, or a technician. We'll find out this week on The Dental Guys. This episode of The Dental Guys is brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, your implant restorative connection. From surgical planning to patient-specific guides, quality implants, and final restorations, the Dental Crafters Network provides one relationship with infinite possibilities. Call 1-800-472-8302 today. That's 1-800-472-8302. And by Restorative Driven Implants. Understand, place, restore, and implement dental implant treatment from John and Wes. The Dental Guys. Go to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com right now to sign up for the next series of courses and take your implant education to the next level. And welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy. John, here we are, episode 72, and I'm excited that uh, season... Three has uh, come to a close, and let me just say this is things have changed and things are moving forward, and I want to talk a little bit about that as we get into this episode and some pretty interesting things that we'll talk about later on, but John, just just to hit it off, some of the things that um, have changed in my office here recently... Uh, well, really, about nine months ago, a year ago, really, that um, I made the decision to kind of start growing my practice in a in beyond just the solo practitioner, mm-hmm. and that starts with planning. It starts with goal setting. Yeah. And as you know, you said the other day, <laughs> you told somebody, you said, you know, it just seems like Wes is just a little harder to get a hold of <laughs> these days. And yep. whenever you kind of reinvest yourself into your business in, to take things, to take the growth to the next level, I mean, you, you, you do become unavailable. And so one of the things that I'm doing as far as vision goes for my practice this year um, and have been for the last six months is we've actively been looking for two hygienists. And I told you that I'm not just hiring one. I told you that I'm hiring two. And we yeah, have successfully like, whoa, whoa. Uh, two hygienists um, for our practice. Now, it took me six months of um, interviews and... Uh, finding the right people. You might think, man, I could hire a hygienist tomorrow if you're listening to this. But, you know, when you go through the interview process that I have put into place and you really want to work in the particular type of office that I have, it takes a while for us to find just the right person. Yeah, I mean, the Star Wars trivia questions are the hardest, right? I mean... You know it. They're it's coming like right at you. It's like 25 Star Wars questions, and you know if you can't answer all those, then you have no business working in this office. There's actually a practical exam on Star Wars, and <laughs> <laughs> you have to construct a, your own lightsaber, right? Isn't That's that exactly the final right. test? <laughs> that is the final test, right? You have to Along construct it out of only <laughs> stainless steel scalers and a curing light. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, it's pretty much. What oh you have to man, do. but yeah, yeah I mean, so, I mean, you you said that to me. Like a few months ago, you were like, yeah, you know, I'm growing the practice. I'm trying to expand some things. But when you said two hygienists at once, man. So, yeah, you've been harder to get a hold of because you've been really, you know, you've been pouring a lot of time into your business, you know, not just your clinical practice, but your business side of your practice. And that's taxing, man. It's it's really, it takes a lot of time. 
Yeah. So, you know, for instance, you know, one of the things that we did before doing that is we obviously prepared um, for this time and it really has paid off. And I told you the other day on the phone, I said, yeah, I'm just thankful that, you know, if the team is 100 percent bought into what we're trying to achieve here. And I think that was really important in the beginning. Uh, even last July, August, we started uh, taking our team meetings and turning them into, okay, where do we want to go from here? And here's how we're going to do it. And, and we started preparing for that. You know, letting people into your system and the way of doing things is mm. very difficult. So the training has begun. Um, it's been a, it's been amazing so far. We have two amazing new hygienists that are working for us and uh, they're learning and growing and uh, I'm excited for their uh, opportunity to work uh, alongside our team. Um, one of the things that we did in preparation um, for this is that, and it really has really changed my practice, um, and we, as we talk a little bit about what I've done clinically, Clinically, I have divided my practice into, let's just call it subcategories. I, I am a general dentist. Uh, if you're listening to this show, um, I practice general dentistry. Uh, but as a general dentist, I've divided my practice into implants and regenerative dentistry, um, I, the, the, the first one. And so and I have a person assigned to that. Uh, it happens to be an assistant that's worked for me for a long time. Um, so she handles all the regenerative care, basically any full mouth, anything that involves multiple disciplines that are um, implant driven um, type procedures. And we're not just talking about single units here. We're talking about full arch cases mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. things like that. Well, we also have a, an Invisalign division. Um, really, it's an orthodontic division. And I have an orthodontic champion. She handles um, not only my Invisalign patients, but she handles all of the referrals um, from and to the uh, out of the office. So, so instance, if if the hygienist, uh, you know, s fill out a form letter that goes out that has all of my problems, uh, clinical problems that I'm seeing, mm -hmm. she gets um, sent a notification that lets her know that hey, that she's going to start tracking these people for us to make sure the continuity of care is continued, and then. The other area is uh, facial aesthetics. Mm -hmm. As you know, I, I am certified to do Botox and Juvederm, and that is kind of a practice, um, um, interesting thing for our practice, but it has really paid dividends as kind of an adjunctive procedure. But we carved that out separately for particular reasons. So I have a person that is in charge of that, um, that is just in charge of the facial aesthetics division. And then and then the one of the big ones uh, that kind of goes along with regenerative care um, is uh, my sleep practice, and that is just kicking off in a big way. Uh, my and we'll talk more about this, but my and in coming episodes, and may even have some special people on to discuss what how we're growing our sleep practice. But our sleep practice, we do have what we call our sleep coordinator or our sleep champion, and she handles all the things that have to do with anything pediatric sleep related, breathing, myofunctional therapy, and then also any mandibular advancement device. And then she's in charge of going out and recruiting patients to our practice from an ear, nose, and throat doctor, from a ENT, um, um, internal medicine, uh, physicians, those type things in our area. She's in charge of that and also in charge of coordinating people to get their CPAPs. I mean, to believe it or mm -hmm. not, she's really helped people to find good DME providers for that. So we could go into like each one of those divisions, but clinically that really has changed my practice because what it's allowed me to do is to be a doctor, um, mm. not just to be um, a manager. Um, I can set, and we'll talk about this, I can set goals for each of my managers, per se, of those divisions, and this allows me to still be the technician. And we'll mm. talk a little bit more about what that means, but it really, to be honest with you, it is, it's changed me. Mm -hmm. It's changed me as a clinician. I feel less stress. I feel like that I've given the team something that they actually are emboldened with. They're they're excited because it's almost like they have this little ownership of their own yeah. little practice inside a practice. That's and my huge. office manager's keyed up about it too because she doesn't have to come to me now. She can go to these division leaders and they have their goals, they have their systems in place, 
it, it really is a great thing. So, John, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> that's Whoa. what I'm doing and what I've been doing for the last nine months to a year, really. And it's uh, starting to come. I'm starting to see the light at the end of the tunnel. I really am, and I'm excited about it. So, John, tell us a little bit about what you're doing. Well, with this last year, you know, I think kind of all, um, it all started back when we took uh, Airway and Sleep uh, out at Spear, you know, really this last season. Um, we talked about uh, kind of how that changed us learning about that about a year ago uh, now, you know, really was when we were, <clears throat> we had just gotten back, it was last June, you know, ridiculous uh, to think it was that that uh, that hot out there, we almost didn't get off the ground. <laughs> and then, you uh, you know, we came home and we just both were like, man, what are we, you know, what are we going to do with this? Because we have to do something with this. And uh, so kind of my, uh, I'll start maybe with that, you know, is is this last year clinically, you know, I've been really working to develop uh, how to integrate airway into the practice and um, how to get better at screening and uh, screening and recognizing patients with airway problems and how that integrates into how we talk about full arch cases, uh, kind of starting there, uh, how we talk about anterior wear cases, um, uh, getting all my team to understand how to screen these patients, especially the hygienists, and recognizing uh, who's at risk, um, and then being able to really help me so that when I come in the room, um, they already are telling me that this patient may be at risk. And it's totally changed the way that we think about uh, wear cases for sure. And that's, mm. so that's been a big clinical focus. I think more for my team, honestly, because, you know, airway and, and sleep medicine, honestly, the, the clinical side of what we actually do, uh, I don't want to make it sound like it's super easy, but it's kind of easy, you know, because mm. we're just, we know how to managing these patients is not really that hard once you know what you have to do. You just have to know mm. what you need to do, but it's the part that's difficult is uh, teaching that to everybody. Uh, it's not difficult to get them excited about it. It's difficult right. to get it standardized. And so I've really been trying to work on that. Um, and, and you know, the next step uh, for me with that is really where I'm, my goal for this next year is to really try to, um, I think my, kind of my steps that I'm looking at taking it is number one, um, being able to do more medical billing with airway being able to yep. do that well so that I can do that just uh, on a just a case by case basis understanding that we've done some of that but we need to take some more formal training and um, trying to explore implementation of more airway and sleep into my practice not that I'm looking we've talked about this a lot on the show but I'm not I'm not just sitting around waiting for work to do like I'm super busy which is awesome I'm blessed but it's more about um, these. once you know it, you have to do something with it. So right now we're just doing it on a very limited basis because of just the fact that you got to have people in place, you got to have systems in place. And it's not that I can't do it. It's just you got to have the people and you got to have the ability to, to really organize it with a bigger office. You know, my associates not trained in sleep, not trained in airway. So it's like figuring out how that funnel works, you know, of his patients. And it's a bigger uh, ship to turn. It really it's a big, is. it's a bigger ship to turn. And that's and that somewhat maybe sounds like an excuse, but it is tough when no, you've got, I don't think so. You, you have to come to terms too, that you, you and I, you almost have to have an employee that is managing that aspect of this dentist. Yeah, you do. Just like you're department. talking about having a manager that that's all that they do. You know, I kind of feel like I need that person and uh, I don't have somebody in my practice right now. Not not that I, I mean, I have people that could do it, but they're doing other things right now. They're doing right. really well at those other things. Well, it's so, where you want to focus your business at. You're right. using airway right now as a protection mechanism so that your your big cases don't fail. Right, right. You For know? my protecting my dentistry, and then but on then a case you have by case basis, that you can't ignore. Right. right. You so, know? I'm, so I'm and having to do it like case by case, or I'm having to refer yeah. these patients because I don't have the the people in my office that can take the time to do and I and I don't have the time for a lot of these people unless I'm just gonna you know waste my schedule and and in terms of like blowing through an entire hygiene visit talking about something that wastes that hygienist time and anyway right so that's that's something that's that's the the vision for this next year is to figure out uh, really exploring that more of how that's going to integrate into our day another just thing that's happened that I kind of have worked with this last year is Two things is one has been changing my hours. Uh, I'm going yeah. to a straight eight schedule on a one day a week um, from seven to three. 
Um, I, I've, I've long known the benefits of that, but it's really taken uh, a few years to, to get that through my head that it's, it needs to happen. Uh, for a lot of reasons, yeah. I'm doing that you on know Thursdays. You does something similar to that. Yeah, right? I, I do happen to know a guy. Yeah, Wes has been doing that for a long time, and, and long I've kind of known that. And so it's something that uh, that helped inspire it. But also, it's been, you know, my kids are at the age where they're, you know, getting out of school at a certain time. It's pretty cool to be able to go pick mm-hmm. your kid up from school and have that time, that magical time that Kirk Barrett talks about, like that 15 minutes after they get out of school where, it's, it's you know, so they're awesome. not, they're like, actually telling you how their day was before like it switches off and they like, you know, become doing their own thing again. And, yeah, so uh, for you. and, and mm-hmm. so that's the kind of thing that's important to me. Plus I challenged when I'm doing, you too. I challenged you. Yeah, you totally did. And, did. It, and it worked, you know, and it yeah. worked. And I will lie. And, and honestly, Kirk Barron, I owe a lot to him because I talked, I heard him talk a couple of years ago about the same thing. And he said, you know, this is a schedule yeah. he recommends for everybody to do every day. And I think yeah. that may be a bit extreme for me, but the point was taken. Um, and also too, you know, it allows for, if you're doing it, say on a Thursday, if you need, if you're going to CE or if you're teaching or whatever it is, you can get out on a plane, you can get out of town a little earlier. Uh, and my associate will still work traditional hours. So it still allows us to have, you know, more of an expanded hours, uh, idea. And, um, I'm looking, it's interesting because, um, I'm looking more right now at, at marketing and, you know, I, I I'm, marketing is interesting. I, I don't really have to market per se, but I'm trying to funnel marketing, you know, so it's not right. marketing for the sake of marketing, but specific procedures that I just want to funnel directly to my practice, working on that for this next year. Or so, and that's been something we've been working on this year. So, you know, there's been a lot of things happen. I think clinically, both of us have been really challenged by sleep medicine and it's really been, you know, two different pathways we've gone on. You've been able to jump in and implement that in a huge way, um, which we'll, we'll really be, I think, talking more about on the show, I know, because it's just, yeah. you're really starting to hit your stride with that. You and I have both gotten to be involved with a pretty amazing group of people with this pediatric airway study club we've Holy put together. You, you really man. did a lot of the putting together. And, you know, guys, we've got a, you know, we may, we've talked about this briefly, I think, but we've got, you know, pediatric ENT, uh, which is amazing. We've got a, a pediatric sleep specialist. We've got a pediatric dentist, and we've got an orthodontist who gets airway. They all and don't forget we have and an oral radiologist, <laughs> oral maxillofacial right radiologist, town, man. who's writing a book on CT. So they're all and, in and the same now town. we have a myofunctional therapist. <laughs> yes, that's right. So yes. we're we're in a situation like I think maybe few people are this where we have an actual team to be able to treat these pediatric hey, John, patients. John, it took it took me it's took it's taken me a long long a time. long time a yeah. long time. I so I'm excited to be to see how that yeah. shakes out over this next Man. year because it's changing the way we look at. We're going to be pediatric. talking more about that kind of thing and just stay tuned. I mean, you can yeah. hear about how excited we are about our passion, which is dentistry, but you also, you know what, we do this because we love our families. Um, you know, I just want to say this is that this has been a great summer. I took time off uh, at the yeah. beginning of the summer and I took time off at the end of the summer. Yeah. And John, you've done the same thing. You've taken taken some good vacations this summer. Yep. And we do this because well, we want to take time off. We want to have time with our families. And that was part of our goal setting, you know, um in years past. We are dentists not just because we want to help people, but we are dentists because it provides us a way to provide a, a living for our families and to be able to spend time with your children. And we, we, I want you guys to know that that's really our core values. Our core values is like you wonder how are we even recording the dental guys. Well, John and I said years ago, three years ago, uh, almost to the date. This is right. We're 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 going into season yep. four here. Right. We said three years ago that we would record this after our children were in bed, after we had put all the things of the day to rest with our with our families. That we were not going to let this take over. Um, and that, and I really feel like that we've held true to that and our wives are a hundred percent supportive of the dental guys. They've been great. And, uh, and our kids like it too. So, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that, you know, the next thing I want to talk about is just some things for you guys about what's coming up this next season. Uh, yeah. one of the first things that I want to just maybe dive right into, and this is maybe the one sneak peek we want to give you because we're really mm. excited about it. But the time this releases, 
we're going to be fast approaching uh, September and Spear Summit. And yep. uh, Get Spear ready Education, for Summit. yeah, Spear Education has reached out to us. And uh, uh, we didn't even we didn't reach out to them. They reached out to us, which was pretty amazing. And they said, "Hey, um, basically, we like what you guys are doing, and uh, we would like for you guys to consider uh, basically covering uh, the uh, Spear Summit." And this is not just any Spear Summit, Wes. This is the ten year anniversary of the Spear Summit. They're bringing back all the speakers that have had the highest. Ratings and reviews. I'm just going to read off their the some of the names yeah, here. Okay, crazy. guys, Marcus Blotz. Okay, yeah. uh, Rebecca Rebecca Bacow. Oh man. Okay. That's like super excited. Wait a minute now, <laughs> Stephen Chu. Oh, Dennis what'd you say? Tarnow. What'd you say? <laughs> just and we're going to gonna get. I we're going to get out off the first four names on the list here. You can head over to. Uh, Spear Education's yeah. website and check it out. Here's the now, thing, though. It's yeah. exclusive. You right. can't get in. No, we're you not can't. saying this because we're saying go sign up for this. If you're a faculty club member at Spear... If you're listening um, to this in your faculty club, hey, man, you're already see invited. You there. Study yeah. club leaders, but it's but it's it's full. It's not like you can get in there and... I mean, we weren't, we weren't even, like, in the club because no, we're we not su- we're not study club leaders we're not faculty club people we just we we've taken a ton of their workshops you know and so they're all their stuff and I'm in a study club but it's not so they just they wanted us to do this because they recognize this is how they can get their message across and, and we're going to be covering it man it's going to be, be like live it. broadcast yeah and we're going to get to interview some of these folks we're we're not going to let out who yet but right. trust us of this hey. lineup you're going you to get to hear some of those names. <laughs> oh, and w- and what I'm looking forward to about this, well, I mean, among many things. I've got one more thing I'm looking forward to after you tell me what you're looking yeah, forward it, to. <laughs> I'm looking because you see one of the things that one of the people I want to be careful here. <laughs> yeah. One of the people from like a while back and I'm not even going to like name names or say anything about it, but they just said, you know, that sometimes some of these folks at these big these big name people they really don't want to be on podcasts. No. And the reason they don't want to be on podcasts is because people get them on the podcast, they know nothing about what they're talking about. They have no clue. Who Really, they just want to get them well, on the show. they're educators, man. It's like they're researchers. And right, and so, yeah, some guys, about. so to be fair, these guys are super nerds, and so that's one yeah. side of it. But on the other side, like, we actually should know what these guys are talking about. So the thing that's that's embarrassing is a lot of times these guys get on the show, these some other podcasts, who knows, who where, and this is probably a long time ago. I don't know. But they'll then the guy goes, Yeah, and the first question they asked him was, What is his favorite soda? <laughs> and so this guy gets up, this amazing speaker gets on this podcast, and that's the question they ask him. And he's like, Well, never doing that again. You know, and so our goal with this, and I'm not saying every podcast needs to do. It's great to just have fun, talk about fun stuff. That's totally. Hey, we're humbled. But but what's really what we really want to do is we want to actually learn something from these people. We want to challenge them a little bit about what some of their theories are about things. Talk about some controversial issues, just the way we always try to do on the show, and and try to see if we can get them on the air to actually maybe be challenged in a positive way not because we know but because we're 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 reading the same stuff we're we're learning hopefully we've been following a lot of these people so we actually have heard them lecture before we have some ideas of what they're going to say and we also know who they don't agree with yeah. <laughs> and so i want to bring up some of the stuff it's going to be so good you agree. know so what what I, were I you going to say, say john a uh, friday night Friday night, I'm bringing it. Oh, okay. Boy. As you know, oh, here we go. I am a costume junkie, so <laughs> I've always dressed Hold up. For Hold on, Halloween. I gotta just let me guys, let me just give you guys a little idea. All right, <laughs> of Wes. All right, I'm sorry, you brought it up. I, I have to go. <laughs> That's fine. That's so fine. Wes and I, Wes I was and a satellite I, dish in a third grade. <laughs> <laughs> you are a said satellite Turner broadcasting dish. System. Oh yeah, man, I got pictures. I love it. All right. If you you (laughs) if you find those pictures, that goes on the Facebook page. So I'll go down there here after a while and we'll put some. Yeah, we'll have to have some kind of contest. Somebody's got to send us a good picture, and then we'll send you a picture of Wes as a satellite. That's what we ought to do. We ought to have a Friday night contest, just a secret. Well, so uh, so the story is Wes and I and our wives were at this place where they were going to have a pirate, essentially pirate night. So it was like a theme (laughs) night. Our kids were going to be dressing up. 
we're supposed to dress up. So I bring a pirate costume. My wife brings kind of a piratey costume. And I'm like feeling pretty good about my $20 Amazon pirate costume. I got some little fake boots. I got some. So I Wes comes walking in. And Wes is like the captain of the pirate ship, man. He's got like the the huge, like with the French hat. He's got like a feather, a giant feather. And he's got like an overcoat, man. Like this thing is serious. Like it looks like he's like this captain of like a Spanish galleon or something like that. And I mean, he just totally blew, he blew me out of the water, man. I had nothing. So I looked, so he's like, you can swab the deck. (laughs) I was like, yeah, that's that's about all I can do. I bow down. To your costume, so so there's a there's a costume thing at this summit, right? Yep. Oh man, you know it. I'm bringing it, man. Oh, I don't I'm even bring it. And you know what's great? <laughs> it's one right up my alley. It's villains and heroes. <laughs> oh boy, it's gonna be good. It's good. So so let's completely change the subject because we want to get into a little bit about what this show today is about. Because you know we were trying to talk about. All right, so we're kicking off a new season, and we're kicking off a new season. We feel like we want to talk about something that's not just a a, a really specific clinical thing. You know, we want to talk about what, what's the the future going to bring? You know, we're talking about the future of our practices a little bit at the beginning. And I think one of the things that, you know, we've been just because of a lot of things that have happened in the last, I don't know, a few weeks, we've found ourselves talking a lot about stories, about people Mm. that have been in tough situations with, uh, associateships, um, new graduates that are coming out of school. Um, but also at the same time, you know, some of the stuff I've been reading from like McGill and Hill and the Collier newsletter, they're talking a lot about practice valuations right now being super high and that corporate is making big investments into buying practices. So it's driven up prices. So it's a very kind of weird time because it's like on one hand, you've got practice values high where people who are selling their practices can get good money for the practice. So I think that they're maybe wanting to find buyers, but mm-hmm. then you've got these stories of these people coming out of school, getting into associateships or associateships to buy in and just having these horrible scenarios. And so, mm. I mean, what I want to talk about Wes is what does this mean about the future of dentistry? Like what's going on right now? Um, why what's happening you know and and well, I, I, well go ahead what do you i mean what well, are you I mean, ta- my, what's your my, take okay, on this so let's just get say that your ten, let's say you come out of dental school let's range the dates here you graduate from dental school and then 10 years out okay and let's say you're not an owner okay you're probably not going to own a practice in your first 10 years maybe you will but that's probably a very low percentage but let's say that you're John and I are my age, you know, in your mid 30s to mid 40s, you're kind of in a growth phase. You're in a growing phase, or maybe you're not. Okay, and so as a you know, I, you know, as a 35 to let's just say 50 year old dentist, you may be looking for an associate if you are growing. Okay, if you want to grow, honestly, because there's no reason you shouldn't be able to grow with the way the uh, what things are going right now, mm-hmm. okay? And then I look at this third group of people. So if you are the 35 to 50-year-old, you could be an, a person that could employ an associate. And if you're this 50 to, say, 70-year-old, okay, which the 50s to 60s really aren't the baby boomers. It's the 60s to 75-year-olds that are still right. practicing <clears throat> that are the ones that kind of had to h- hang around a little bit or wanted to hang around mm-hmm. that are, you know, maybe they have an associate. And we, we hear some great stories, to be honest with you, but we also hear some terrible stories and mm-hmm. ab- about associates having trouble working with, you know, any, any uh, owner, okay? And so what is happening with associateships? And it, it, we, we, we want to make a quick daggered response and say, hey, it's the millennials' fault or it's, you know, this generation's fault or it's whatever it is. It doesn't matter, okay? We're not trying to point fingers at anybody here, but really what I think we ought to talk about is some solutions for this, 
Right. You know, I don't want, I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't want corporate dentistry to take over. I don't think it will, okay? That's my opinion uh, because I think the mighty consumer in America, the way America is run uh, right now, I think the mighty consumer values customer service, mm -hmm. and I think they value quality, okay? I really do. Why is it that there is a Target and a Walmart, you know? and right. Um, why is it there are, I mean, why is it there are things that are cheap and why is it there are the things right. that are still... There's always going to be a place for, right. I think, different types of dentistry, different business models. There will be. There yeah, will be, and I that's those, fine. And I don't yeah. think, that, I don't want corporate, because it's dealing with health care. We're not talking about TVs here, people. We're not talking right. about going to CVS or Rite Aid years ago, and you could buy a cheap TV, like a 17-inch LCD TV, and you could, you know, or you can go down to your local Best Buy and buy a $5,000 TV. We're not talking, we're talking people's lives, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking people's teeth, and I think, I'm, 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 I'm passionate about teeth, it's not a heart transplant, but wouldn't you want the best heart? Wouldn't you want the best, we're fighting what medicine is dealing with, Okay. In, in some respects, we are fighting what medicine and doctors are dealing with right now, and we don't right. want it to dominate our industry. What we want is we want people to have a choice of whether they want to pay for things or whether they just want it to be provided for, okay? Now, I am the kind of practice, and so is John. We're very biased, and the people maybe that listen to this show are very biased, and maybe you're not. Maybe you Maybe you haven't been listening to this show, but we believe in about taking it to the next level and providing our patients with a good value for the money, okay? Now, that might mean that you have the best crown, John, to provide the patient. Listen, I don't have A and B crowns in my office. I have a crown, and whether it needs an Emax or whether it needs a zirconium, it doesn't matter. So I, I digress there to say this, is that... We are dealing with a situation where practice values are going out the roof. Mm -hmm. And if corporate sweeps in, okay, and buys a ton of this stuff, we could see dentistry make a turn for really what I feel like is cheap, okay? Right. Because really the almighty dollar dominates then and the profit margins dominate. And guess what gets cut? the materials we use and the choices that we can make and the CE that you can go to and what you can learn and how you can advance your career. Now, where I see fault in what's going on right now is that there is a, there is a, there is a group or maybe just a, a host of dentists that have an opportunity, okay, to pass on their knowledge right. freely. And I want to say freely. It's called apprenticeship, Okay or mentorship, and we hear a lot about this, but are, are we, are you all that are, are owners that are looking to bring on an associate going to pass on your knowledge to your associates? Right, and I think that that, you know, gets into the, this, this idea of practices that are worth more <clears throat> yeah. can either be taken well, it can be taken several ways, but one of the ways that it can be taken is, well, I'll sell out to corporate, you know, and I'll stay on and work for them for a couple of years, watch them. I'm not saying they all do this, okay, but if they're not considered, to me, considered ideal, they may come in and kind of dismantle the systems in your practice to become right. more cost efficient as the number one thing. And mm -hmm. you can, you know, kind of watch that happen and your practice can become part of a, a big group, uh, which... Maybe okay, maybe not. Um, or you could say practice values are going up, so I'm going to just try to sell out and get out as fast as possible, make as much money as I possibly can. Uh, or I'm going to actually try to invest in the next generation with the fact that practice values go up, so that's good for me, but I'm also going to try to make sure that the quality of dentistry that I'm doing is so high that I'm actually going to get a premium for my practice because I'm doing really high quality dentistry. So somebody wants a practice like that and I'm going to take the time to pass that knowledge on like Wes said. And you know, the thing is, is that 
I know there are people doing it all three ways. You know, there's people just selling mm -hmm. out to corporate. There's people that are, you know, just trying to get out, make as much money as they can, maybe take advantage of people uh, if necessary. And then there's people who are, are looking for a balance of that, of trying to pass on knowledge and still get a good price out of their practice. You know, a few years ago when practice values were maybe lower, uh, you know, during say the recession, you know, that was a time when if you wanted to sell your practice, you were taking a big risk. And so you maybe were better off staying solo, uh, during that time because, you know, you couldn't get a good deal. So you didn't want to set up something, but now that the economy is, is picked up and you've got a glut of retiring doctors coming up, um, it seems like this is the time where you got to make a decision. You know, how do you want to go with bringing somebody into your practice if that's what you're going to do? And I think it's interesting, really it brings up this big question about why, why are we seeing at least maybe a lot more stories of associateships of dental, you know, we were having this conversation the other day, dental students get out of school and I think that not all of them, but most of them have to be taught to be bad. Whoa. I don't think they come out bad. No, I think I don't. they have to get taught that they have to be, that has to become ingrained in them. Right. You know, we talked the about first this time they bit. see somebody right. not use a rubber dam on endo, they're mm. like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Then the next time they're like, well, they've Maybe never okay. had a problem so then after you see that a certain number of times you start to go well eh, it's probably not that big of a deal and you justify right. it somehow in your mind i think you have to teach that now there are people that will cut corners naturally absolutely yeah. but i think that i'm just wondering what's going on with that you know why are we seeing these people getting taught you know no nobody comes out of school very few people come out of school and they want to do crappy work you're taught in school that the ideal the ideal the ideal yeah you don't come out wanting to do trash. Yeah, you want to make money, sure. But somebody has to teach you to be a bad dentist. I mean, heck yeah, man. You you came out wanting to do the best to pass your board. You were using gingival margin carvers to make sure you didn't have shards of enamels on your prep. Right. And you were making sure you had the smoothest, very nicest prep. And And then you get out, and then you see the trash, okay, and, and listen, don't say that we're stupid that there's not a lot of trash because there is trash. Yeah. I mean, we <laughs> reference all trash all the time. It's in the journals, okay? Right. The dentistry is not great. And, and, I, and I really feel like that, one, you have to want to learn, but you also, you also can see and learn from seeing. And if you learn bad, okay, that's how long does it take to sear your conscience? Mm. You know, like basically you, you do it bad so many times that you just, you don't, you don't, it doesn't bother you anymore. Yeah. I, and, and, I, I, <laughs> and I think that you, you know, you, you, it's the same, you know, we talked to, to, I remember a couple of years ago talking to Kevin Quishan at Spear and he was talking about, he gave us some real hope, you know, cause he said, I'm seeing a lot of young doctors coming out and you know, they don't know everything, but they want to learn. And he was, but I think that, you know, so you, you take that, you're somebody who's in education, who's less biased than we are, and he's saying he's encouraged by the, the, the young people getting out of school. I hear a lot of those stories, but then I see them after a little while, in, and I see what ends up happening, and I think somebody taught you that. Somebody right. either taught you to be great, or they taught you that it, didn't, that it doesn't matter, and you now right. you had to accept that. I can't take the responsibility away from the dentist who's doing the work. I mean, when you see a bad yeah. impression, you know it's a bad impression, guys. I mean, you know. Yeah. You know, it's your decision whether you accept it. You know, don't tell right. me that you don't know it's bad. But I think if after seeing, you know, your senior doctor or the other doctor in your group or the other doctor at the corporate practice, whatever, accepting that and just putting crowns in, putting crowns in, putting crowns in, you, you may be. Either you either you 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 change, you have to go somewhere else, or you just accept that. So, John, and do we owe our owe? Do we owe as a dentist that's been practicing fifteen years? Do I owe an associate that I will hire someday? Do you owe your associate to show them what good dentistry is, whether they want to know or not? Good dentistry is this. Do you owe that to them? Well, and I and I think that that. 
the question of what do we owe to an associate? I think I, I, we owe it to him because it's for the profession. It's for the yeah. preservation of good dentistry. Well, and if they're coming in to work, I mean, I, I've heard so many, and we've both heard so many opinions about what uh, a practice's responsibility, what the senior doc's responsibility is to an associate. And I've heard anything from, you know, I'm just going to, they're just going to come in and work for me and we're going to make money. And that's the main thing. This is part of my business. It's a business decision. And I don't really care. I mean, not that I don't maybe really care. I don't hear people say, I don't care, but they kind of read between the lines. You can see what they're doing. They don't really care. They just, as long as you're producing, you're good. I don't really care what you're doing. And then you hear so, people say, I'm going to mentor. And I think that is what we, if, if we want the future of dentistry to be better than when we left it, then we owe it to the associate to ensure their success. So not necessarily that we do it all for them, yeah. but we have to lead them there. We have to that's allow the, them the that's opportunity. That's the word I was hoping you would use is leader. Okay. Yeah. And so before we go down this leader route, um, John, let me just tell you somebody that's, that I have felt like that has helped us, you know, with our practice. And we're, we were using some of their products and they approached us because we liked them. And that's Zerk. And, and you know, Zerk loves the dental guys because we first loved Zerk. I mean, you know, it's kind of weird, but it is true. Yeah. We were using Zerk mirrors, um, uh, a long time before the Crystal HD, and then we didn't even really know it that we liked them. And then, like a year or so ago, I switched my entire practice over to Crystal HD. They didn't pay yep. me to do that. I bought those outright. Yep. And and John, you switched your practice over there. And and then recently, we talked a little bit about Zerk and the. You all, if you haven't seen our review on Mr. Thirsty, mm -hmm. hey, check that out. It's on yeah, our Facebook like page. You're going to really like that if you if you um, really check it out. If you don't have any type of uh, isolation system in your office with a bite block built in, hey, listen, try out Mr. Thirsty. I have wore it myself. You'll see it in the video. John tried to drown me with a gallon of water, <laughs> and it, it was impossible. Um, and so... Uh, and, and then also, John, you're trying out some new products with them this week. I am too. But yep. listen, we, we like Zerk because they're about innovation and doing things right. They approached us and they were like, hey, we want to help some of your listeners out. So if you're interested in getting uh, $10 off a 12-pack of mirrors, hey, check out the promo code DG10. Um, and then if you want a double-sided mirror, which my hygienists love, if you've never used double-sided mirrors to clean teeth, okay, or even doing a dental exam in your hygiene room, hey, look, I recommend the Crystal HD double-sided mirrors, and you can get a $5 off a four-pack of those double-sided 5DG is the promo code. Links yep. are in the description. You don't have to rewind and play this again. And, and then, if these aren't the, the best mirrors that you've ever used, I don't, I'll be very surprised. I don't see how have, you would even not think that. Yeah, because I mean, they're brighter. They, they, they have a coating on them that's brighter. They're just they're I'm clearer. sorry if you're in... If you're in a if you're an associate and you don't have any say so over what you buy, right? Go buy some just to yeah. check them out. <laughs> They're not expensive either. I mean, you can change all of your mirrors no. over for really very, very cheap, Reasonable. and they have a disposable plastic. Which it was kind of funny because Wes was like, "I kind of feel like there's a secret out there. These plastic ones, you can get them and you can autoclave them, and you know, <laughs> right. it's." And they make it look like it's disposable, but it's not really it's disposable. Not. You, I think and it's actually, true. Actually, Molly told me it wasn't disposable, and I was like, "Man, that's a pretty good deal." Then on I HD know, I know. So you can even buy the plastic ones and make that a permanent part of your kit, or just have that around the office if you want a high quality mirror. You know, they're, they've really this is something that definitely changes the game. Yeah, we like on a Zerk, daily basis. and they like the dental yeah. guys. They approached us about some deals for you guys, and we want you guys to check them out. Support them because they support us. They help us yep. to bring content to you guys and and keep this show going um, and help us so, to be able so to let's, spend... So let's go down that leadership you know, road that yeah, you here's were talking the thing. about. It's, it's in small business, okay? If you're less than 50 employees, you're a small business. Right, John? Isn't that the definition yeah. of small business? I okay, think that's so, right. I think that's it. And that's most dental offices. Even if you own like five, okay, you probably have maybe not that. Maybe if you own less, maybe if you own three or four, you have less than 50 employees, okay? So the, the, the problem here is leadership. 
Okay, right. so everything right. rises and falls on leadership. Okay, so if the dentist, the owner of the practice, does not lead, okay, or does not have the vision, is not the entrepreneur, is not the one goal setting, mm -hmm. okay, then that means somebody else has to, okay? So if you sign on as an associate, now people that are looking for jobs right now, if you go for an interview, you should ask, what's your goals? Because if the owner does not know the goals of where they want to be in 10 to 15 years, they have no vision, okay? Now, they might be a manager right. and a technician, Okay. Well, let, and let's unpack that what, just a minute because yeah, where we're getting this, where we're getting this from, conclusions you know, here. we're running out of time. No, that's <laughs> that's true. That's true. You know, we just we if if there's a book that I think is helpful, yeah. whether you are in, I think if if you are an owner or a potential future owner of a dental practice, a book that's both it's well, been very I think influential. It would help associates too, to be yeah, honest. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a it's an essential piece of reading if you're in in, in any kind of small business environment. Uh, it's called the E Myth, and uh, the E Myth is all about kind of the 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 myth being that many people in the United States think that if you are in a small business, especially as the owner, that you have to work yourself to death, and that the mm -hmm. myth is is that an entrepreneur, a small business person, is just going to get you know you just you kill yourself for a living, and that that's just what you do. And the whole idea is that you know you, we have to figure out there are basically three definitions of, of parts of a personality that you may be good at and that's you, you have to ha and you have to have them in every business you have to have a technician somebody that does the work uh, you have to have yep. an entrepreneur somebody that has a vision and then you have to have somebody who can manage and and our uh, can you do all three john yeah the book's conclusion is is that there are very 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 few people that can do all three well there are a few people that can do two uh, and there are most everybody can do one uh, and so what you have to figure out is what are you good at? Which role do you want to play? If you want to be a technician only and not be a manager or an entrepreneur, totally fine. That's associateship That's just all a dentist long. that's showing up to work and doing yeah. crowns and fillings. And, and you can do great dentistry. You can do awesome dentistry. If you are an owner, though, you have to now take the responsibility of figuring out which of those roles do you want. Do you, have, do you need to be an entrepreneur or can you have somebody else that can do that for you? That's what corporate is, basically. It's, it's corporate is you know, the entrepreneur and the manager. Uh, mm -hmm. Or you can implement that in your own practice. You can say, I'm going to have the vision and I'm going to be the dentist, but I'm going to have somebody manage. Or I can be the, the technician and I'm going to have somebody manage or I'm going to have somebody else do the vision. Or maybe you're in a group where you have people that each person has the different skills. Maybe you have a dentist in a practice who doesn't even practice. They're just a visionary and they're yeah. just a manager and they own a few practices because they're good at that skill. So I think that when you're talking about this problem of, of who are we, as owners or as associates or as people looking for this, it all starts with this idea of, you know, maximizing who you are and, and realizing what the value is of somebody that can come into the practice. But I still think the question may be more that you hear these days instead of what do we owe our associates is what do they owe us? You know, we talk mm -hmm. a lot of, but you hear a lot about that of like, well, they you owe about us. The good old boys club, they owe us to work hard and because I had to. Right. You know? Or or they just have the idea to do this because I had to do this. Right. Or just the idea that associates are there to make money for you, for the owner and that they should just be happy that they have a job. Yeah, they get because, all the pedo. They right. get all the pedo and exams for a year and they don't get any new patients. Right. Or I'm going to do all the the crowns, you know, or I'm going to do all of this or all of that just because not because they can't do it. But because um, I need the I need the production, because I'm I, if without that I would be hurting or something, you know. Instead of it being about trying to mentor, trying to train, trying to teach, and you, again, you can't. You're not there to make them successful. Like they have to make themselves successful because that's your their responsibility, not yours. But, but I do think you led, have to have right. right. You have to lead. You have to be there to provide leadership and. You know, so I as mean, an Wes, owner, what do you I think, think it's to... important to recognize, well, what type of person am I going to hire? Right. Am I going to hire somebody with the like-minded, you know, vision? 
Okay, mm-hmm. because like we said, I would never hire a hygienist that didn't have buy-in to what my goals were. And so I was point blank honest in interviews or somehow got out of them what their goals were. And if they didn't align with my goals as a them being a technician, basically, then why would I hire that person? You know, that doesn't make any sense, does it? So why are dentist, you know, owners hiring associates that don't have the same buy-in or they don't even talk about what the buy-in is. Like, what is the buy-in? What is the vision of this practice? There's right. no communication, you know? It's it's really boggling to me that there's even a problem because yeah, it all starts and it, it starts and stops with communication. It, it does. And, and I think that when you get down to it, though, the question that I have been maybe baffled by and I look at the future of dentistry is I think, you know, what is the major problem that we see keep seeing and I think the major problem that seems to be the common theme in these in these situations that fall apart is almost always a lack of leadership, almost yep. always a lack of communication, and then also in insufficient uh, expectations that are set between yes. the owner and the associate or in a group between the partners, uh, whatever arrangement you want to have um, about what is expected. And, and that is not necessarily what's expected, like what time you have to show up to work, but like what's the expect, what does the associate want to get well, out okay, of Well, okay, I mean, honestly, what do you want to get out not... of that with them, you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's just common business. It's simple. I mean, anybody it's else simple. would say, I got a job, here's the I expectations. I mean, I guess, you know, you know, one of my hygienists I've turned into a sleep champion. If I said, just be the sleep champion, just be it. I'll pay you a salary. You don't have to practice hygiene anymore. And I never had metrics for her. I never set a vision. I just said, just go do it. Just right. show up. Yeah. What in the world? Okay, yeah. so like if you so who would do that you in, a in place any other like business that. that would never happen. They would just be like, <laughs> you got a job. Happen. You got a job. You know, you'll you'll figure it out as you go. Just kind of watch what I do, maybe. But then sometimes I'm be gone, and you'll have to figure it out on your own. And then right. if things don't work out, then I'll fire you. You know, it's right. like ridiculous. So I, I, I guess I, I So see... wait a minute, John. Here's yeah. the reason. Here's the interesting thing. According to the U.S. Small Business Administration, over 50% of small businesses fail in the first year and 95% fail within the first five years. That's crazy. That's crazy, yeah. right? So it tells you how many of these things... Either they didn't figure out the e myth problem, you know, they didn't figure out what they needed to, what they were good at, and what they needed to find to help them, um, right. or they just couldn't communicate, or lots of other things. But I look at dentistry and I think, you know, I, we have successful transitions, obviously, that happen. But mm. what I think a lot of people are looking for these days, these days, is they're looking for a long term associateship position where they can be mentored, where they can learn, and they can make a decent living. They don't necessarily want to own. They want to be taught and be helped to accomplish their goals, which are very different than the owner's goals oftentimes, and that's fine. And I'm seeing all these failures, and I, then you see these you know, folks that don't, they don't know where to go next. They don't know how to find these people that care. And I think that what's happening is now you have the next generation, Wes. You have the generation that graduated school, learned bad habits. Mm. Now they're hiring associates. That's what I'm seeing now. I'm seeing that 35 to 45 group. That's even more worrying to me because, you know, I, I've seen a lot of older guys that, that, you know, there's been good and bad, but a lot of those are looking to transition out, okay? So they're going to get out of the practice, and then the young doctor can make the practice what they want, hopefully. But when you're talking about a long-term relationship, this yeah. is where it really worries me. you got young doctors, younger doctors, hiring really young doctors, and yeah. the mentorship, the leadership, the communication's not there. And it's like, it's a business mindset. You hear it from a lot of the big names too. I mean, you hear yeah. it from the the Howard Ferrands of the world. You hear it from, you know, a lot of the business podcasts that are out there is that, you know, just look at what an associate can return on investment for you. 
Yeah, it's all it's all business. It has nothing to do with clinical, and that's why most of the things that we hear are business oriented. And and I think like you think you've got the clinical down. You know, that's kind of assumed when you come out of dental school that that that's kind of like well, you now I I didn't get any business classes in dental school. Yeah, uh, and 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 you you think that's a false thing is like, yeah, you need business. Right, Absolutely. but you know what you all you need you need is just you know what creates the business is that your your technical ability. Yeah, I and, would take and, a great technician who knows mm. that they're a technician first and hires the entrepreneur and hires oh goodness, the manager. Manager, I would take that what are person. Ma- uh, it's just I could get digress. Yeah, I know, I know, but I would take that person all day long over the really great entrepreneur. Oh my goodness, who has, a technician who has no that knows what they're doing skill. can crush it. Can yeah. crush it in any industry. They'll always have a job. Right. And they'll always be well paid. Right. Don't and, make the mistake as as a technician of thinking you have to do it all. You know, no. find a place where you can have somebody who can help manage, find a great entrepreneur with vision or learn those skills, develop those skills. But I think that, like you said, Wes, it all comes back to really from the beginning of the show. What yep. started the whole thing off with us? Tripod implants, watching trash day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out, and then having young doctors that we meet where Except they don't that. even know where to begin, they don't even know where to start. And then seeing older doctors who should know better and don't, and they want to have an excuse about the economy or an excuse about how much things cost or an excuse about this. And meanwhile, you know, their clinical skills are in the trash can. And then we wonder why corporate has, has risen. And, you know, guys, we just think that, that we're not the popular voice these days. The popular voice says, just get better at business, just become a better manager, a better entrepreneur. And don't worry about the technical. Just hire a, a couple associates. They'll make money for you. And, and we just think it's the complete opposite. We think that, you know, be a great technician, know your limitations in business and develop them. And, and then that is what will create a business that is sustainable, that you can even replicate if you want. Yeah. Because it's all based on things that don't change with time technical skill, knowledge, things that you acquire, you, you, you know, this is something that you're the dentist, you're the technician. No one else can be the dentist for you. You know, you have, you're in charge of that, own that. And then when somebody's coming into your practice, pass that on, do it right. mm -hmm. And you know, that's the thing that makes us excited about the future. When we talk to younger doctors who do find those situations and they Mm -hmm. get involved and they start learning and this is what we keep hearing people talking to. I mean, what they want more from us is they want, they're looking for more of that. They're looking for more. Show me how to do things. Show me mm. how to do a better job at this because I, and I am in general, Wes, positive yeah, about I the younger too. generation of dentists and what they want out of the profession. I think a lot of it is the right thing. I just worry well, we about- We preface this whole conversation that everybody comes out of school wanting to do what's right, I think. I mean, I feel like that, that you've been taught what's right for the most part you have a good foundation. Yeah. That's 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 the reason the dental guys exist. Is the dental guys exist to help you guys connect um, with uh, people that are always wanting to improve, to make things better, to better dentistry, to move dentistry forward. I want to encourage all dentists uh, that listen to this, whether you're a specialist. Whether you're a GP, most of our listeners are GPs. We have some specialists that listen to our show. That I want to encourage you to reach out and 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 help uh, other dentists that want to learn. Find some dentist that wants to learn and wants to take it to the next level and invest in them. Whether that's a an associate that you hire, or whether that's someone that um, you know is looking for. Um, help in another city or a town. The dental guys were created to really as a voice to help get out what we believe is good dentistry or what and bring bring maybe connect you guys with people that me you might not know about, research that you might know not know about. And that's what we're going to continue to do. We're going to continue to find people that are doing it right, find people and challenge them right and so that you guys can can take that back apply it to your practice, 
apply the the nuts and bolts that we kind of pare down for you. Yeah, and, and I think that, and I think too, just to like maybe go right back to the beginning of this real quick. If you're listening to this right now, I want you to think about these three things we started off with. Mm. You know, yeah. What are in the last year of your practice? Yeah. What did you change about the vision of your practice? Whether yeah. you're an owner or not, doesn't matter. What did you change clinically? What did you learn and implement that was new, that was clinical? Hopefully there was something that was game changer. And then what's your goal for this next year of practice? And I want you to, to write those things down. Post it on our Facebook think, page. And post yeah, it, on it on our on Facebook a- page. Yeah, put it up and inspire other people. Send us a tweet. To, to you know, take their stuff to the next level and tell us what you're, what you're working on and how you're trying to inspire your team. And if you disagree with us, tell us corporate dentistry is awesome. Yeah. Tell yeah. it it's the best thing that ever happened to dentistry. Make a case. I make a case for make it. Make a case for it. I'd love to have you on the show. If you think that corporate dentistry is the best thing for dentistry, I'd love to have you on the show. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. I mean, it's a great discussion. It'll, it's it's going to be a never-ending discussion, too. It'll you be know a never-ending I mean, discussion. You know, it'll go on. And, and so, you know, I, I think I just want to just say again, thank you. Once again, to our listeners for this has been awesome. su- for supporting us through this last season, um, uh, we hope you like uh, you know the new music. We hope you like a little new intro. We're getting all that together right now for the release. Yeah. It'll be exciting. Um, we're we're glad to have you along for the ride. We're looking forward to catching up with you at Spear Summit. If you're there, come come say hey to us. Let us know you're listening. Uh, let us know what you want to hear more of. Connect with us on social media, as Wes said. Thanks to all of our so- our sponsors and support uh, supporters that have brought us through this far. Have allowed us to do more than we ever thought we could uh, we could do. Uh, it's been a, it's been fun, Wes. It's gonna it's gonna continue to be a pretty awesome ride, man. I'm excited. So for for Wes for John, we are the Dental Guys.